Hi, my name is David Bose. I'm the Communications Director for Washington Policy Center, and welcome to Washington Policy on the Go, our monthly event series uh, during the legislative session. We do this weekly, uh, but we provide a, a virtual uh, event series for you to catch up on the latest on state policy or important policy events. We interview our research directors, um, and occasionally we have special guests uh, to bring you the latest on state policy. Uh, you can also check out our blog for updated information and uh, we would urge you to share that information with your friends and family and others that you might know, neighbors that are interested um, in key policy events. And that's at washingtonpolicy.org. And you can subscribe to our free newsletter, our Friday uh, email um, that is free and, uh, and shareable. And you can get an array of information on the latest of what's happening in the state. Today, we're going to talk, tackle two things. One is Washington's increasingly expensive and unserious uh, climate policies with Todd Myers, our environmental director. We'll talk with him in just a moment. And then we'll talk about the impact, the policy impact of the election, including um, the impact of the election on issues like rent control, uh, workplace rules, um, critical race theory, and income taxes, all of which saw some action in Washington state. So we'll talk about those things uh, coming up as well. And then after we speak with each of these center directors, we'll have a Q&A section at the end. So at any point during uh, this broadcast, if you have a question, just go to your toolbox, your Zoom toolbox, there's a Q&A icon, two, two little conversation bubbles, click on that, ask your question at any time. Uh, and we'd urge you to write them down and, and put them in that, in that box, in that queue, uh, so that you don't forget, and we can uh, we can get straight to them uh, toward the end of, of this broadcast. So uh, with that, I'd like to bring on Todd Myers, Washington Policy Center's uh, Director of the uh, Center for the Environment, uh, to talk about uh, Washington's uh, climate policy, particularly since the governor made a point to um, burn some burn off some carbon and fly off to uh, <laughs> fly off to Scotland uh, to let us know how serious Washington State is, is getting. Um, Todd? Um, what about the governor's trip to Scotland? W what was his stated reason for going? And what was the stated reason? Um, what did he hope to accomplish? Yeah, so I think that you don't know it's a real climate conference unless everybody flies in in their private jets and flies in from all over the world. That's how you know. And, and so okay. w when he does this and when he flies off, what's, what's he hoping to accomplish? What what was his stated reason for, for uh, attending? As well, he what he said was, is, I mean, he constantly claims that he is a leader on climate issues. And so he has to be part of these discussions um, to guide you know, American and worldwide climate policy. Um, but what he has announced are two things. First is um, that he is going to make the state uh, vehicle fleet 100% electric by 2040. He will not presumably still be governor um, in 2040, but he has promised that the state will do it. And the other thing he did was his, his work with what's called the Pacific Coast Collaborative, which is Oregon, California, and British Columbia, to announce that they were gonna support clean construction. And what I thought was particularly interesting about that is one, he didn't need to go to Scotland, but two, um, there's a specific statement in there from the premier of British Columbia saying, that the best way to improve um, construction was by shifting from concrete and steel, where appropriate, to wood. And he pointed out that British Columbia has a lot of wood and a lot of timber that can be harvested to make this transition. So there are a number of groups, environmental groups in Washington state who wanna shut down timber. It's sort of an echo of the timber wars, you know, two, three decades ago. And yet we now are coming back where they want to literally stop all timber harvests on state lands in Washington state at the very time that the governor is signing an agreement that says we should be doing the exact opposite, which is using timber as a construction material because it's the most environmentally friendly. So those are the things that he has announced, neither of which requires that he be in Scotland, but he's there nonetheless enjoying uh, some nice whiskey, I'm sure. As the governor um, tried to clarify that issue at all knowing that you know, there has been a movement in Washington state, uh, particularly among those within his own party that, have, um, that has sought to shut down timber harvesting in, in Washington. No, and I don't expect the governor to because the governor's earliest 
efforts on environmental policy were to shut down timber harvests. So in fact, in 2004, he was the leader among congressional Democrats um, opposed to the Healthy Forests uh, Restoration Act, which was a policy that said that we needed to do more thinning, more work to um, reduce the amount of dead and dying timber in uh, federal forests. He actually opposed it and said that we shouldn't be doing thinning any more than a half a mile from communities. He wanted to let you know large areas of the forests basically die and burn. Um, that was his approach. So he has long been opposed to a more active management and active forestry. And he will, from time to time now, say that he is not, but when the rubber meets the road, he hasn't been there. So I hope he has changed. Um, uh, Commissioner of Public Lands, Hillary Franz, has been very clear that we need to do more thinning and more harvesting. And now the climate angle is just one more reason that we should engage in sustainable timber harvests, because uh, it's also a better construction material. Now we just need some reporters to ask uh, these kinds of embarrassing questions, both to the Premier of British Columbia and to the governor to see how they, how they mesh together, try to create some kind of international incident to uh, shine some, some greater light on the issue. Um, well, I, I hope there isn't an international incident. I hope that uh, the wisdom from Canada comes south a little bit uh, and convinces the governor. Uh, the Canadian border is open, so we should have it open to good ideas as well. Um, so I hope that he will do that. You, you ask about asking questions. So I was interviewed yesterday by NPR um, about the fact that the governor is over in Scotland um, touting his credentials as a climate leader. And I pointed out that in fact, that Washington state has missed every single one of its climate targets. And the most recent data for 2019 show that emissions are going up, not down. And so his spokesperson, when, when was asked about that, she said, well, yes, we're failing. That's why we need more power. And so the irony is, is that the governor has consistently said that we should trust him because he is a leader on climate change and that's why he needs more power. But when it's pointed out that in fact, he's not a, a leader that we are doing badly, they say, well, that's the reason the governor needs more power. So there is one common denominator and it's not, it has nothing to do with uh, helping the environment. Glad you brought that up because that was uh, that was the next thing with you because uh, I'd read that um, I've read that several times of course in your blogs as you bring it up, and yet time and again they still get the positive headlines, which just astounds me every time. I'm, I'm glad NPR asked you about that, but typically the politician, in this case the governor, because you know he's been governor for a long time, he'll um, he'll just step forward, make a new announcement, and everyone forgets that the last announcement was a total failure. And there's no skepticism. And so you get these great headlines saying, I promise to do this and it's going to be great. And that's where the real you know, benefit comes in. It's not an environmental benefit, but a political benefit. Well, there, there, was, a, there was a sort of an absurd, absurd example in Scotland where the governor was on a panel with representatives of Hawaii, Oregon, and Illinois. And a reporter from the Hill magazine tweeted out, uh, boy, the, the Governor Inslee is doing a real stand-up comedy routine, kidding everyone else about, you know, competing for the second best climate policy, policy in the country. So I quickly looked up and said, well, Washington, while the governor has been in office, Washington has reduced its per capita CO2 emissions by 1.3%. Oregon has reduced their per capita CO2 emissions by 4.8%. In Illinois, over 8%. So here he is sort of, you know, mocking other states for not being as good as Washington. But when you look at the numbers, they're cleaning our clock on the standards that the governor thinks are most important. So it is really just a lot of bluff and bravado and rather than environmental results. All right, two more questions. One is um, whether or not uh, any of the reporters asked in an era of uh, of shutdowns where people aren't supposed to uh, aren't supposed to get together into crowds, and uh, that's been going on, you know, uh, what seems like an eternity, but for the last year and a half or so, a better part of two years, and the governor's been a very strong, you know, hey, no unnecessary travel, no unnecessary this and that, um, and has the the state legislature has met via Zoom or um, uh, or a go to meeting or what have you, um, and it, we're the host of numerous high-tech companies that do the same thing. Did any reporters actually ask why they took the full-on 
you know, the plain entourage travel routine to get together instead of just meeting on screen if they wanna create and talk about a world where people use fewer fossil fuels? Not that I have seen. I'm sure that people have confronted um, members about this very fact, and I have seen lots of people mocking them for that. I have not seen any Washington state reporters. They, the governor held a press conference yesterday and nobody asked him about it. And maybe they will, but I doubt it. I mean, when he ran for president, he traveled all over the place, was asked several times, Will you be um, investing in projects that offset your CO2 emissions? Um, and they never answered. Um, and I doubt that they're doing it this time either. Um, they are um, somehow absolved um, from the standards that they hold everyone else to. Now, I could understand why the press would be quiet if they were invited along, you know, and then they got a free trip out of it too. I don't understand why they're holding back now. It seems like an obvious question that everybody wants. And it's not even a partisan one. It's one where, where just a, a, a casual observer sees this kind of thing. You've got somebody with elite status coming back and saying, this is what needs to be done. P.S. I'm at a luxury hotel in Scotland being able to describe this to you. And then we wonder uh, why. And then finally, I did want to get one question in about salmon. Uh, Todd, you've uh, brought up a number of times that those who want to uh, destroy the Lower Snake River dams are talking about spending 300 years of salmon uh, recovery money to achieve a minuscule, if any, result uh, for a single salmon run in the Lower Snake. Um, and yet the governor has come out, you know, more strongly since we last talked in favor of taking out these dams. What's the status of that? Well, what the governor, the governor has not said that he favors taking out the dams. He just wants to find, he just wants to study how we can make it happen, <laughs> which is Sorry. a little bit of splitting a hairs a uh, yeah. That, yeah, that I think we can all see through. Um, but the irony is, is that last week, um, the Puget Sound Partnership released its uh, report on the state of Puget Sound. Uh, not surprisingly, Chinook are not recovering in Puget Sound. They were listed as threatened in 1999 and have basically made no progress since then. Uh, meanwhile, um, Chinook populations, and the one of most concern is the spring and summer Chinook and Snake River, um, are, are higher today than they were in the 1990s. The average uh, of the last decade was higher than the previous decade, which was higher than the previous decade. So they're moving in the right direction, albeit slowly. Um, and the fact that there is, there are people willing to spend $33.5 billion on the Snake River when we spend $100 million a year on everything else in terms of salmon recovery, I think just shows how completely out of whack our priorities are. Spending money isn't the be all and end all, but the, we do, there are projects that need to get done. And the fact that we are willing to spend 330 years of funding on one small area, rather than on the area that is most important or the salmon are struggling most in Washington state that is most important to Orca and frankly is most important to commercial fishermen, I think just shows you how politics has completely overwhelmed the science um, and reality of this situation. And it's very frustrating. And just to put a you know, final point on it, um, all of the people who claim that the salmon stocks are about to go extinct on the Snake River um, I offered to bet them. I said, great, look, we've had two years now of increase. There is a cycle. There was a down cycle. We're coming back up. We've had two years of increase and all the signs point to an increase next year. But if you think that the salmon are going extinct, then bet me. If you think that they're going to decline next year, then I'm willing to bet. And I offered to bet all sorts of the biologists and other activists who claim that that's what's going on. And do you know how many of them bet me? Zero. So it's, it's uh, only uh, two people bet me, one is an activist um, and one is uh, the editorial page editor for the Lewiston Tribune um, who only bet me $5. Now, I'm not complaining about $5. At least he was willing to put his money where his mouth is, unlike a lot of these other environmental groups like the Washington Environmental Council and the River Keepers and these other biologists. They know the truth and that's why they won't bet, but politics, unfortunately, on these issues when it comes to salmon is really detached from, from the truth. And it's frustrating. Thanks, Todd. We'll get back to you during the Q&A section, which uh, politics is a good way to end it, since now we're going to talk about uh, the politics of the last election. We just uh, had, had an election. We we're going to talk about the policy impacts 
uh, of it. We're, and we'll start with Lee Finna, our Center for Education director, who's been writing a lot about critical race theory and the uh, challenges that that presents to parents and to equity and fairness um, at, and non-discrimination in Washington schools. Lee, thanks for coming on. Um, it actually became the biggest issue in politics uh, really over the past week because it's widely attributed uh, as uh, one of the deciding factors uh, that moved Virginia, which has been a, a purplish, if not a, a blue state of, of late, um, moving over solidly into the Republican camp with a major upset in the governor's office. Why do you think uh, critical race theory um, has caught on so strongly among parents and, um, and is and has, has captured the public's imagination so much? Well, I think it's because everyone understands when they find out what's really in it, especially parents, when they actually find out that the schools are teaching their children uh, that their identity is based on their race and sex and not on their individual humanity. Uh, every parent of every background and every color understands that that is an attack on the integrity of their child. And so uh, this is this this was one of the big issues in the Virginia race. And it all came out of Loudoun County where there is where there were mothers that were finding out, you know, through the COVID school shutdowns, what the kids were actually being taught. Mothers and fathers, they call themselves mama bears and papa bears. They came to these school board meetings and started complaining and saying, why are you doing this to our children? Then they were mistreated by their you know, duly elected school board. And, you know, one father was arrested for speaking out against what was happening in the bathrooms in, in one of the high schools there. One of his, his daughter was assaulted. And so the, the mistreatment of parents by, these, by this education establishment forcing this, uh, this theory that, er, that is wildly unpopular among parents and the, anyone who knows what's in it, people don't like it because it segregates children by race. It's, it's, it, it teaches that white children are part of the oppressor class and everyone else is oppressed and can't get ahead in this society. This is, it goes straight at the base, you know, the underpinnings of our, of the American dream of our founding that all men are created equal and, you know, entitled to equal treatment before the law, before the, before, you know, so, so this, this really, all the polls are showing that, that, that the mothers that voted for uh, Democrats in the past switched over and voted for the Republicans because they didn't like what the Democrats were doing with the school system. It's, it's an amazing thing. It's, and, and here in, in Washington state, there, I have noticed there are school board members that were running on the platform, got elected and, and deposed some incumbents who were putting this through. So it's, it's uh, filtered here to Washington state as well. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask about that, but um, I've also read a number of comments uh, from left-wing commentators um, saying, well, you know, this is a, a giant distraction because it's not taught in public schools anyway. And I see that in Washington State, too, where, you know, there's nowhere in the curriculum, there's nowhere that says we're going to teach critical race theory. And, I've, and, and this has kind of captured um, the attention of a number of people, uh, usually left of center, but who teach in schools on my social media pages and they're saying, well, look, this is a non-issue. We don't teach it. It's, it's, not, even in, it's not even the curriculum. My, my, you know, they make reference to the uh, WEA or something telling them that it's not there. What's your response to that? Well, it is, it's shocking to see reporters who are supposed to be telling the truth to the public deliberately leave out what is in critical race theory content. This is a lie that is being promulgated to try to change the subject, but it is a fact, the critical race theory. Okay, so this is, the, this is the game they're playing. They're saying, oh, the course critical race theory that is taught in law schools is not being taught in our elementary schools and high schools. Well, of course it's that course is not being taught, but the principles of the idea, the content of this uh, ideology, this orthodoxy, this doctrine have, are, were actually, are actually being taught in the schools. I can show you the lesson plans. I've seen the lesson plans. And remember, Dave, that the governor uh, on May 5th passed Senate Bill 5044, which required all the teachers in the public schools in Washington state to re receive training in this critical race theory ideology and all school board directors. So, so for, the, for them to come and say, it's not in the schools, it's in the schools by order of law and mandate by the, from the governor. 
Well, I recall you showing here, actually, when we did one of the Washington Policy on the Go episodes specifically about your work on critical race theory, you showed a pyramid, and then and this was supposed to be the pyramid that supports white supremacy. And there was a category uh, toward the foundation of the pyramid that was basically, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but it was essentially, it was the Martin Luther King dream message, which was yeah. those who say that um, all men, and I'm using that in the um, rather old antiquated uh, gender neutral way, <laughs> all men are created uh, equal and that uh, we shouldn't differentiate by color, that that, that was supposed to be now something that, that uh, that supports a white supremacy society. Do you remember that pyramid? And, yes, and, yes. Uh, and that was, where did that come from? Was that a state document? Was that dealing with That Washington was a trading, that, that pyramid, the white supremacy pyramid, it was part of a training in the North Thurston uh, district schools. Uh, That's right. It was, a, it was a, what was it? I forget the name of the high school. It was the Tumwater High School, I think it was. And uh, it, it's, it teaches that, uh, uh, whites are responsible for ethnic cleansing. Remember at the very top of the pyramid, that's the worst thing that whites are doing. They're ethnic cleansing, they're killing people. And then all the way down to the bottom, the, as, you, as you rightly remember, is this, uh, this what they said, that they've twisted all reality and they are dismissing, the critical race proponents are dismissing Martin Luther King's uh, uh, saying and, and, and uh, famous, famous uh, call to us all to judge one another on the content of our character, not on the color of our skin. And he's now being dismissed as critical by these critical race theories as part of the white supremacy. Just like you see people, you know, like Larry Elder running for, you know, to, to running for governor in uh, California being called a white supremacist. And, and you're seeing uh, the woman, uh, uh, what, what is her name? Um, the woman who just wrote, uh, who won the lieutenant governorship, Sears, Winsome Sears. She's a black woman. She's run on the on the on the on the platform. The critical race theory is bad, and that that our society is a good society. That the American dream is real. She's she she embodies it. She's been called a white supremacist by liberal black professors. So it is it is intended to foster suspicion and division and discord. Uh, critical race theory, and it is happening. I mean, there's an article in today's Seattle Times about what's happening at Ballard High School. Did you read that article? It's it's appalling. They, some teacher was teaching uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and she misspoke, and now she's been attacked as a racist, and the principal transferred the student, and he's now being called out as as uh, also retaliating against a student who's mis- Who's, who just swallowed the line about this oppression that uh, whites are trying to oppress him and now is spitting it back to attack their teachers. So this is really bad situation. Uh, and we're gonna see more of it because it sets you know, people against each other on the basis of race and, and, and it is a hateful, illegal, racist idea, which we need to stop. I have an article here from Education Week saying 25 states have already introduced legislation to try to stop this. There's there's uh, national groups forming to try to uh, give support to people courageous enough to say no. I've heard that there's going to be uh, a bill, a couple of bills introduced in the next legislative session that uh, to uh, to uh, repeal Senate Bill 5044. So you know we'll see what happens. It's a big issue. So. so uh, with Virginia had a heavy uh, impact. Um, right now, Washington State, um, as you point out, there's been a number of school boards that may have school board memberships that may have been decided by that issue, or it might have drawn people into those those elections. Um, but I think it's fair to say our election wasn't. Um, we didn't have the substantive substantive uh, races as, as much um, that were being contested. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see what happens there. But there was another issue that kind of came up on accident during this controversy in Virginia that, that does apply, I think, to Washington State as well. And that was the question that was offered to uh, former Governor Terry McAuliffe, where he said, I don't want, I'm paraphrasing again, but basically he said, you know, I don't think that uh, parents should be telling us what to teach in schools. Mm -hmm. And this comes back to who's in charge of the child's education. And this has been kind of the heart of the matter for Washington Policy Center and for a number of parents out there who are dealing with schools shut down 
for the better part of, uh, of the past you know, two years, shut down or limited in some ways, where parents are realizing, wait a second, I need to get, uh, I need to advocate for my child's education. I need to direct my child's education. And I'm being told that the system is more important than my child's education. And, it, and it, there seems to be a, a new awareness anyway that, um, that really parents should have, I think people kind of assume that they have this authority, but they don't, they don't really have that, that they're kind of, their child is part of a system. There's a great dedication to the system, not as much dedication to the students individually. Absolutely. I mean, you hear these mothers that have been speaking on the news channels about why they voted for the Republican. They're saying that they were, you know, remember for the last year and a half, the school system basically foisted the job of educating the children onto the parents and, and parents had to scramble. And many parents found it this very difficult to do because they were trying to hold down their own jobs. They were expected to you know, supervise remote learning over their over the computers. And so on the heels of this, then this happens in Virginia and they're, and they're treated like dirt. Literally, this is what the mothers are saying. They were treated like dirt by the school board, by all the institutions above that. They, they tried to work through the system, including the existing governor, Nordham, who wouldn't meet with them. And, and they, were, they were shut out. And so this is why that statement by uh, Terry McAuliffe running uh, against the uh, Glenn Youngkin just took off when he said, parents do not have a right to direct the education of children. He was just expressing what the public education establishment thinks, that it's, they think that they own the children, they get the money, they decide what the children will learn. Well, they, they're, they're gonna hear from parents now because parents have seen that the system does not work to serve them, it serves itself. And that's why uh, we just published a study uh, uh, describing the, the surge in school choice in other states across the nation. 16 states have expanded their school choice programs to give parents an option. So if they're not being served properly by their public school system to go into the private school system. So that's, that's, a, good, that's a positive move. Yeah, that's another issue that's it's, uh, essentially nonpartisan. It doesn't have to be partisan because you can have you know, uh, people, uh, well, plenty of people involved in the current uh, elections have been uh, self-identified as Democrats saying, look, this is my number one issue. I, I need choice for students. I care about uh, the direction of education and uh, this is gonna change. So- you know, Dave, uh, Dave, let me let me remind you about what happened in the 1920s. Back in, uh, there's a US Supreme Court case which, which was brought by, uh, private schools when the state of Oregon tried to prohibit the education of children in private schools. And that case went all the way, they tried to shut down every private school, prevent people from educating their children in private school. That went up to the Supreme Court and the, and the Supreme Court held this, that the child is not the mere creature of the state, that it is the parent's right to direct the education of their children. Now we're gonna hear that language many times again it is, it is enshrined in our constitutional law. It is, it is part of the, our inalienable rights as, as citizens of the United States, of this country. We have the solemn and sacred duty to direct the education of our children. And no, no school official shall tell us, you know, uh, what is right and what is wrong. We know what, what should be done. And, and uh, this is a movement that's going a great, distance. I can feel it coming. Parents are fed up. They, they have a right to better from this system of public education, and, and they are being heard now for the first time in a long time. Well, I, um, you know, as they say in politics regarding McAuliffe saying, you know, that, uh, that he doesn't think parents should have the right to direct their child's education or shouldn't have a say in what their children are taught, um, you know, they're calling it a gaffe and, and uh, in politics, a, a gaffe is when you speak uh, directly and truthfully to the voters. So, <laughs> so I suppose if you use that uh, definition that's long been established as a joke, it's a, it's a gaffe, but otherwise I think he was speaking pretty openly about his own worldview there. I don't think it was a gaffe. I think it was, he was just honestly saying what the public school system thinks. Yes, that's, that was my point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, all right, thanks, Leif. We'll get back to you with the uh, Q&A section. Let's go okay. to Mark Harmsworth, who is our director for our small business center. He's been tracking some of the controversial issues, the results of those issues in Bellingham. Uh, he wrote one of the citizen's guides 
uh, on those issues. Two big issues in Bellingham, one dealing with rent control, the other dealing with workplace rules and, and, uh, and your employment and what your hours can be and how your schedule is formatted and how long you get uh, to, to be aware of your schedule. Um, and basically a micromanaging of, of, uh, of private employers by the government. Um, what's, uh, what the, let's talk about rent control first and narrow it down, Mark. Um, rent control is going down in Bellingham. How close is it? Yeah, so the rent control initiative, which is initiative one, uh, has about 400 votes in it right now. Um, it looks like it's going to pass. Um, it started out with a much wider margin on election night. Um, and now, again, it's getting a little close there. But um, the, the, the issue here, and both of, there's actually four initiatives. So the um, rent control will pass? I, 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 I'm sorry, I, it's go, it, it will fail. It will pass. fail then, okay. Excuse right. me. Yeah, scared me. I was like, what? Yeah. I, the last I saw it, this is a big news. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay, we're four, so the, the, the no votes are, are up by 400 right now. Yeah, so yeah. both the initiatives we're talking about today are bad policy, and we want to see both of them fail, and they both are failing right now. So uh, thanks for the clarification there, David. That wouldn't have gone down so well if we'd let <laughs> that one fly. Um, but the four initiatives there are really just a microcosm of what went on in the legislature last year. Um, a lot of these ideas were pushed at the state level, and they're going to try it again, I'm sure, in the future. But I'll talk about some of the impacts of rent control specifically, since you've mentioned that just now. Uh, basically, this was uh, imposed, um, think of it as a relocation assistance program. So the the owner of the property, the property owner would have had to have paid to relocate the renters. And this is after a monitorium now for rent, you know, eviction monitorium, which has been put on us by the governor for over a year now, where you've had property owners and most property owners, and for some reason, the state seems to think, or at least the bureaucrats of the state seem to think they're multi-billionaires with thousands of properties and Megler corporations and, and condos in Bellevue. That's not just, that's just not true. What it is, it's families that grew up in a house, were lucky enough to be able to afford to move to a new house and rent their original home. And that's the, the type of person you're talking about. So they've got two mortgages, and then you put this monitorium in place, and it puts a lot of stress on those, um, especially if you have a bad renter, and a lot of renters, they've worked with their landlords to work it out. But on top of this, now the city of Bellingham, which is a little bit of a liberal enclave up there, um, is pushing this uh, rent control process. And we put a policy out about this 90-day uh, freeze on rent increases, 8% over any 12-month period. And there's legal potential uh, penalties are up to $7,800 per rent on you. And if they kick somebody out who's not been paying the rent. Um, and then there's this relocation piece as well. So um, it wouldn't have helped the rental market. The whole premise of this by the po people that were pushing this concept were saying, we're going to get more affordable housing and everyone's going to have the greatest rental experience ever. Well, that doesn't work out like that because what would have happened is the uh, landlords and these property owners would have said, yep, and that's it. I'm done. I'm out of this. I can't afford this anymore. It's literally bankrupting me. They put the house back on the market again, sell it as a house, uh, a non-rental property, and that reduces the amount of rental inventory that's available, which then demand and supply pushes the cost up. You know, the government coming in, putting more in control, just exasperates the problem. So really, really bad piece of policy. Thankfully, it's failing by, like I said, 400 votes. Um, and we'll see how that goes. I don't think, I haven't checked this morning, but I don't think there's enough now based on the percentages for it to turn that around. So it looks like that's going down, but you know, they'll bring it back at some point in the future. But the title was renter rights and all this kind of stuff, but that really isn't what this is about. This is rent control. Yeah, they don't like the control word there. It probably doesn't pull as well, but it, it is interesting to me as a concept. And when we see something come, you know, even relatively close, it's, it's you know, as Jason will tell us, I'm sure, uh, coming up in a few minutes, he's, he's like living the, the political version of Groundhog's Day, where every year he has a new income tax issue to deal with, no matter how many times the voters bat it down, because it's, it's a desire. And, and when a policy like this comes up, where you're able to promise something for free, you know, you're telling people, hey, I can make your rent go down by just telling this third party that they have to pay for it. And, the, and they ignore the unintended consequences, you know, the, those are sometimes harder political arguments to make because one side can say your rent's gonna never gonna go up beyond 1%. So it's an easy thing. 
And then the response is much more complicated to explain to people what unintended consequences are. You know, and if, if property values, for example, are gonna go up by 30% a year, but your income on that property that you've invested in can only go up by 8% maximum, um, you know, it, all of a sudden it becomes a, a, a money, there, there's an opportunity cost there that loses you money keeping it as a rental, you know. So, but, but that's a harder and more complicated uh, uh, argument to make for, for those who are not watching those things. So, um, but anyway, we, we've got the concept there. It seems to be going down. Uh, we both expect to see more of that coming up in the state based on previous statements. What about uh, workplace rules? That seems to be kind of a new fascination with the left, which is, you know, hey, um, now we got to figure out how to, how to control people's schedules and make rules uh, regarding how employers uh, go about hiring people and what hours they can have and so forth. Uh, describe what's happening with that issue in, in Bellingham and, and where it's going to go. Yeah, and again, this, um, this was brought up at the state uh, in legislation earlier this year, and then I think Bellingham's being used as a test area for this. Um, basically, what it does is uh, requires employers to do some scheduling way out in advance. So um, it sounds fine on paper because you think, hey, I'd like to know when I'm going to work. But if you imagine, put yourself in the position of the small business owner, he's got a, a corner store and he's trying to schedule the staff. And in, during the Christmas season, uh, what this basically will say is, look, you need to say with confidence that your staff within the next two weeks are going to have these scheduled hours. And on top of that, you have to estimate when you hire them how many hours they're going to work for you during the year, which is incredibly difficult to do. But within that two that two week window, if for example, there's a snow day and nobody's coming into the store and you've scheduled three people to come in and serve bunt cakes at your little bunt store, then um, you have to pay them half pay even if they can't work. So what that will do is an employer will look at that and say, well, I'm not going to risk confirming hours until the last minute when I know conditions mean I can bring somebody in, which reduces the hours for somebody to work, which is not what the initiative was uh, targeted at. It was said that it's going to be reliable, reliable work hours. In fact, it has exactly the opposite, um, the opposite effect. And it increases costs because the employer now has to pay more when they miscalculate, reducing the amount of money they have for their employees. On top of that, there's a hazard pay of $4 uh, per hour for emergency declarations. It does not describe if that means at home or at not or not at home. So you've got the concept that Seattle pushed, which arguably has failed. We've seen QFC close down in Seattle when they tried doing this uh, on Queen Anne, where they came in and put a hazard pay on the employees and QFC said, oh, no, we're done. We, we can't do that anymore. We just can't afford it. And that store closed down. You're going to see the same thing in Bellingham. You'll see businesses that are thinking about relocating to Bellingham will go, well, if we just go the other side of the tracks, we want to be subject to this. And thankfully, this one's going down in flames. You know, people can see right through this and understand that um, the the booking of these hours in, in advance like this will absolutely destroy small business. And it's just a war on the, the entrepreneur who's, who's trying to make a living for himself and his family. And as a result, he hires a bunch of folks in town and gives them jobs. I mean, it's a great opportunity. And it seems every we return, you know, liberal policy is putting its, its boot on the neck of these small businesses and preventing them from actually doing what they do best, which is grow our economy. Thanks, Mark. We'll get back to you in the uh, Q&A section there and, and uh, have more on Bellingham. Let's move quickly now to Jason Mercier, our Center for Government Reform Director. Uh, Jason, um, we had one income tax issue on the ballot this, uh, this time. It was Yakima um, trying to decide, should we or should we not ban a local income tax? Um, tell us what happened. So Dave, we actually had two income tax measures on the ballot, one locally in Yakima and one statewide. I forgot about the state advisory. You're, you're right. So the local one. Took that for granted. The local one was a charter amendment. Yakima is a charter city, and there's only a handful of them in the state. And basically, a, a charter is the city's constitution. So they amended their city charter 78%. So it was a pretty close election. 78% mm -hmm. of voters voted to ban a local income tax in Yakima. And this is following what Spokane did in 2019. Another charter city, that one was only 72% of voters did that. 
But basically what that means is for those two cities, there will be no local income tax unless they sign off on it because a charter amendment will require another vote of the people. And these local income tax bans, they've basically been catching fire here since the legislature passed the capital gains income tax. Last year, there were only three cities with this type of prohibition. We are now up to 11. And in fact, two counties, just this morning, Franklin County commissioners voted to ban a county income tax. They joined Yakima County. So, I, you know, I know that this is uh, going to be fair use. You don't have to worry about any copyrights, but Olympia, can you hear us now? We're up to 10 statewide votes, 11 if you do the advisory vote, which we'll talk about in a minute. You've got 11 cities now saying, no, really, we don't want an income tax. At, at some point, you hope that the uh, state officials will get the message and move on. Well, the, the major paper in Yakima, if I remember correctly, uh, called this a red herring, uh, saying that this was not, this is uh, the kind of thing that's a great boogeyman of income taxes. Nobody's talking about an income tax. What a complete waste of time. You know, I, I've never understood that argument because it, it doesn't take me very long to mark my ballot, you know, for whether I agree or disagree with something. It's just filling in a small circle usually or drawing a line. But, um, you know, I, I think when you've got 78 percent, it's also sending a message to that attitude, too, um, which we also saw at the state level when we knew full well numerous people arguing against uh, taking a stand against the income tax were, in fact, working on behalf of income taxes. But on the state advisory vote uh, that you bring up, some would call it the advisory vote on the excise tax. Uh, the IRS and every other state in the union and you would say it's about an income tax, but you know, who's to say? Um, <laughs> how, how is that advisory vote faring? So these advisory votes are a leftover of, you may recall Washingtonians passed seven separate times a ballot measure to require a supermajority vote of the legislature to raise taxes. Again, just like we banned income taxes 10 times, seven times, strong majorities of the state said, we don't want taxes to easily go through on a party line vote. We want broad consensus. But ballot measures are only good for two years, and the legislature would routinely suspend that restriction with a simple majority vote and then raise taxes. So the last time that we voted on this, anticipating the legislature suspending this requirement, the ballot measure included these non-binding advisory votes. And if the legislature is going to raise taxes without a vote of the people, we're going to at least going to get to weigh in on it with a non-binding advisory vote. Now, fast forward a couple of years, and this was actually, you know, our current Speaker of the House is uh, Speaker Jenkins. When she was a freshman lawmaker, she called this her freshman project. Her freshman project was to sue Washingtonians, to sue the voters for this tax restriction. And, and a couple of her colleagues put together a little show on the floor of the House and set up a process to where the legislature sued voters for restricting their ability to raise taxes. And surprisingly, the Supreme Court agreed and said that supermajority requirement is unconstitutional. So though the court struck that requirement, it left in place these advisory votes. Now, a lot of people will say there's, these are non-binding, they're meaningless, voters don't make any distinction with them. But I will tell you, they, we've had a couple of dozen of these votes, which is an indication of how often Olympia raises taxes in the past 10 years. And on 10 occasions, the voters actually said, you know what, maintain that tax. We're voting to maintain that tax you passed. So they make a distinction. Not so on this income tax, this capital gains income tax advisory vote 37 being recommended for repeal by 61% of voters statewide. And I guess the last point on this, why are this carries a little more weight than in prior years. And in fact, you saw the Seattle Times editorial page, who was no fan of these advisory votes, actually recommended to voters, vote to repeal the capital gains income taxes. We need to send a message back to the legislature on how they adopted this. As if you recall, and this is a, a quote from Democratic Senator Mark Mullet, who actually voted against this tax. But when he was giving his floor speech why he was voting no, his, his statement was his party was moving heaven and earth, heaven and earth is what he said, to deny Washingtonians their right of referendum to overturn this new tax. The legislature put a fake emergency clause on it. So it's pretty clear what the legislature thinks voters would do with this. And now with advisory vote 37, we, we see they were correct. There is not support for this. Yeah, I was laughing because I saw a, um, a left-wing group where at least an, an individual who, who uh, has a group title um, had a press release out warning people about this advisory vote and, and how the legislature needs to challenge this because they tie Iman's name to it, you know, uh, with, uh, because he's, he's an unpopular name. 
And they say, well, people don't know that it's not binding. And I thought, well, the title is advisory, right? <laughs> advisory is in the title that the advisories are not mandates. Advisory is just advice. And so I think people are pretty clear on what that is. And as you point out, um, they have made distinctions between different proposals at different times. So it turns out we're capable of reading and, and, uh, and sharing our opinion as, as well. Let's get into the Q&A section. Uh, for those of you who want to submit a question, you can do so at any time. Try to use the Q&A section rather than the chat because it's, uh, it's easier for me rather than to juggle back and forth. However, uh, Wendy uh, is, uh, is uh, angry a bit at WPC. So I'll start with Wendy. She is writing, I think this will, uh, will be to you, Leave. She says, uh, what's wrong with having history books tell all sides of historical events? There are many wonderful Anglo-Saxon Anglo people who built our country. However, they didn't do it alone. Many wonderful people of African descent, Hispanic descent, Asian and Native Americans built this country also. Before the 21st century, most history books did not even mention women who made great contributions or, or made contributions to make our country great. Why is your organization afraid of the truth? Many people who were discriminated against still overcame obstacles to make outstanding contributions for our country from Japanese Americans who volunteered in the military during World War II to women as mathematicians, enabled the US to be the first in the race to the moon. They're not mentioned in history books. The US is a wonderful country and should celebrate all the people who make it great. So uh, your response to that uh, well, long declaration. Well, I would uh, just say that Wendy has done us all a favor in putting before us the misdirection that the media is saying opponents to critical race theory are about. Opponents to critical race theory want the full teaching of our racist past all the way back to the founding, but they want the, pro the, the, the full history to be taught, not selective history that, that pushes a certain narrative that can be, uh, can, for example, well, anyway, you can go on forever about the teaching of history, that we do not, we believe in the full teaching of our racist past. It is a falsehood. And what I'd like to ask Wendy is, why does she support the teaching of racism to children? Does she support segregating children by race? Does she support teaching children that they're bad because they have white skin or that they're never gonna make it in our society because they have brown or black skin? Is that what Wendy supports? I very much doubt it, but she doesn't wanna talk about that. She wants to, change the subject. And the fact of the matter is that this is what is in the schools now, even if the newspapers don't report it. It is in the schools. I'll show you the lesson plans and we need to get rid of it. I'm kind of fascinated because, you know, I, I, you can see from the gray in my beard, I'm not a spring chicken anymore. However, um, it doesn't seem like that long ago that I was uh, back in school. And we did learn about the internment of uh, Japanese and slavery and other things in, in high school history. Um, and I think that those are important things for uh, kids to learn about in, at an age appropriate level. But what you're talking about, Leave, is, um, is this idea, not, not historical events, but this idea that there are attributes to the human skin that make one an oppressor or oppressed. And that's where uh, the segregation and this ideology um, you know, that's where you're drawing the line. This, this, I guess the best way to describe what Wendy is suggesting is that that is a red herring. This is not an argument over what is taught about race in the schools. It is an argument over teaching children that they should be racists. That's very different. And that is, so, so that's the bottom line. This is a hateful, divisive, illegal, indoctrination of our children and it is dangerous to our society broadly and we need to all get in this fight against it just like the brave mama bears and papa bears who are defending their cubs from being hurt by this terrible way of thinking so let me i want to just jump in and add two quick things one which is my wife's family um spent time in japanese internment camps and United States. So this issue is not abstract uh, for her family or for me. Um, and I think we ought to teach about FDR's illegal executive and racist overreach. Um, I think, I mean, to, to show the evil that government can do, um, which is why you know, one of the things that I have been working on the past several years 
is reducing occupational license barriers, um, which make it difficult for uh, minorities and, and immigrants to get jobs. Um, and in fact, uh, this year we had a breakthrough where we reduced barriers for people who have a prior criminal record who are disproportionately minorities. And um, our bill was endorsed actually by King County Black Lives Matter. <laughs> so uh, where we can partner with groups um, who don't agree with us on many other things, we will do that. And there's a perfect example this year of where we have reduced government barriers um, to allowing people um, of all backgrounds to get jobs. And we're going to keep doing that. Yeah, and we can say the same thing about charter schools and numerous publications that we've made um, about uh, about the state assigning students by zip code to schools that have failed year after year after year after year. And that's not us saying they failed. That's the state saying this school's a failure. <laughs> and and they, they just they just stop calling them failures and keep sending these kids there, even though they're not they're not going to be ready for the world and they're, they're going to lose the opportunity for a, a prosperous future. Next question is for Mark. It's uh, more of a statement, Mark, but it's something for you to respond to. So you think it's okay for an employer to schedule a worker to close a store late at night and then have to open a store early the next morning? This happens often in retail stores. And it does. And most of these employers are going to be quite reasonable about understanding that they won't schedule the same individual the next morning unless they want to work. And that's the whole point is giving the choice back to the employee to say, hey, if I want to pull a double shift because I need a little extra money, I'm able to do it. Instead, a lot of these initiatives, what they're doing is putting a box around this and saying, no, you can't schedule this. You can't do that. You must have all these types of breaks. And we're way past that from the, you know, the early 1900s when people couldn't take breaks. Um, but it puts this restriction on both employers and employees where they can't work when they want to. What happens if you only work two shifts a week and you just happen to want to do those two? And 99.9% .9 of employers are totally reasonable with this. And there's already labor law in place that protects this type of thing. So these initiatives for a lot of these types of restrictions are just totally unnecessary. Glad you brought that up, Mark, because the first thing I thought of was uh, when I was in college, I was uh, working at Walmart. And, um, and one of the things I used to do is close. I had the closer shift on Fridays and the opening shift on Saturdays because I needed to work as much as possible when I could work. You know, So I would ask for that kind of, of shift so that I could maximize my weekend hours so I could study during the week. So um, it's, a, it's a great point. It wasn't fun, <laughs> by the way. It's not the best fun I've but had. But it was your choice. That was and my choice and it's what I needed. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And then I would have had to get yeah. a second job. You know? Yeah, and these initiatives would take that choice away from the employee. Right, right, exactly. Uh, next question, this is, um, how can we leverage the results of Virginia to help education policy in Washington? Um, now, Washington Policy Center is a 501c3, so we don't take uh, a partisan position on, on things here, but um, people in power tend to look at results and movements of people and the will of people, and Virginia has been a certain wake-up call, um, and, and education rose surprisingly hot in Virginia. Do you think, Leave, that, um, that there is a leveraging, or does anyone, uh, anyone who wants to comment um, how Virginia's results might impact Washington State's uh, policy toward education? Well, I, I um, have followed public education for a long time, and I've noticed that there's not much accountability uh, over results in the public schools that parents have, or that anyone has. Uh, and so this election in Virginia, where a, a, a governor was elect, elected on the strength of of suburban women and men uh, who voted for liberal Democrats in the past, now voting for a moderate Republican uh, on the grounds of education should send a chill through uh, states like Washington state, where that is a one party state for many years. This is, uh, I think that, that uh, there's a real possibility that finally someone will listen and because of the threat of losing an election. I mean, the public education is supposed to be serving families, and it's not. We have failing schools that fall, that harm low-income minority children disproportionately, as, as Dave said earlier. 118 schools are identified by the state that's, that are not educating 44,000 students in Washington state, and no one ever does anything about it. They just shrug. 
But and, and that's because there's no accountability. And the power structure we have with the unions controlling many of our elected representatives uh, block block efforts to expand charter schools, options for children. And that that is something that everyone is now aware of because parents are speaking out across the country that we need to we need to parents need to have more power to direct the education of their children. And lawmakers are doing that by giving them control over a portion of their funding that the state provides for educating their child. And that is that is the hope for the future. And I, I, all we can do is pass along our, our uh, research and, and uh, analysis of these different issues and uh, to help to inform the public about what's happening. Before we get to the next question, or um, I, if any of you want to uh, follow up uh, for Leaves comments, you're welcome to do so in just a moment. But I do want to remind people that we have another event tomorrow evening. It's a virtual event. It's why kids get assigned to failing schools and how to change it. A conversation on education policy with Black Minds Matter founder, Denisha Merriweather. Uh, she is the Director of Public Relations and Content Marketing at the American Federation for Children and founder of Black Minds Matter. Uh, she previously served as school choice and youth liaison to the Secretary of Education at the U.S. Department of Education, and she is a Florida tax credit scholarship graduate. Um, she's been featured in the Wall Street Journal, PragerU, the Washington Examiner, Education Week, and Fox News, as well as other media outlets promoting school choice. Um, and so it's going to be an exciting conversation tomorrow. Again, that event is free. Um, it starts at six o'clock. So I uh, wanna make sure that all of you have a, an opportunity to sign up for that. Uh, just go to the events page at washingtonpolicy.org. Or if you look at the chat function in your Zoom right now, I sent uh, all of you a link there you can access and, uh, and sign up for that as well. Did any of you wanna, uh, wanna add to Leaf's comments or are we ready for the next question? All right, next question. If the capital gains income tax is not ruled unconstitutional before the end of 2022, are we going to have to file state income tax returns? Jason. So I don't see any scenario that the Supreme Court rules by the end of next year, but on February 4th is when Douglas County Superior Court is hearing the case and a Superior Court is bound by Supreme Court precedent. So there's no way that court can find income not to be property and every other state in the IRS will tell you a capital gains tax is an income tax. So the expectations are that trial court will invalidate this, put a stay on it. The question then is what does the Supreme Court do? So the, the, the short answer, it depends, but I don't think there's any way we have a final ruling for the Supreme Court next year. Next question, uh, do we have any theories as to why the state legislature has been so unresponsive to the electorate's advisory votes on taxes? Does it indicate a certain democratic deficit in our system of government? Uh, Mark, as a former legislator, you wanna take first crack at that one? Yeah, I mean, many legislators get elected with all these ideals and, and things they wanna run on. And so it's, um, what you see is when the, uh, when the population effectively votes against the ideal that they think they were elected on, uh, that's when you see a lot of the indifference. I mean, there's also this sort of group mentality between the caucuses as well. So, you know, Republicans, and the Democrats down there, and they, they sort of stay together. You've seen that and they vote on different things. So it's self-reinforcing. If you're against a certain thing and you see, uh, you see an advisory vote supporting it, you, you, know, you self-justify that as a legislature because you're basing it based on your geographical area. So if you're from Seattle, which is predominantly more liberal, and you see an advisory vote against something, your own constituent may support that, whereas statewide, it may not. And so that's why you see a lot of the indifference, particularly in uh, towards taxes from the more liberal areas. And then Eastern Washington is obviously against a lot of these taxes too. So that's, that's why I don't think it shows our system is necessarily broken, but what I would like to see is at least the legislature respond to these votes and have a discussion and justify why they didn't overturn this or go back and revisit these votes. But that's gonna take some uh, legislative fortitude that many legislators don't have. It's interesting, I think also there's, there's a lot of races in Washington state that are just really not that competitive, or at least they haven't been. And so I look at it and I think, you know, it's if you're a legislator and you see the people are upset about one thing, you might take a much closer look at it if you feel like, you know what, um, I could be in trouble, but if you feel really comfortable where you're at, you're not that worried about pleasing people. 
Um, right. Not, have, not as much anyway. You, you have to represent niche. everyone in your district, whether that's 50%, 25%, or 5%. Hey, Dave, I know we're bound on the clock, but to quickly pivot on the, the non-competitive races, we are still waiting for the redistricting process to be approved. It is looking unlikely the commissioners are going to come to an agreement. So expect the state Supreme Court for the first time to, uh, in the words of the Chief, Chief Justice, get out their crayons and draw the state maps. I hope it's not crayons. Well, that, that should be interesting. <laughs> um, I'm not sure I have greater faith in them either. So. Uh, uh, but that's me. I want to thank each of you for attending. It's been a packed show today. Uh, we do this uh, every second Tuesday of every month. And during the legislative session, we usually do it once a week. Um, we'll have this video broadcast available on our YouTube channel coming up and, and our social media channels. Uh, so I want to thank each of you for attending. Don't forget, tomorrow night is the conversation with Black Minds Matter founder, Denisha Merriweather. You can just go to the link in the chat section or go to WashingtonPolicy.org events. And you'll see that there, it starts at six o'clock, I think. Um, and that event is free as well. Thanks so much for attending. And we hope you enjoyed this episode of Washington Policy on the Go.